From Corolla One Studios in Glendale, California, this is the Adam Corolla Show. Adam's guest today, Jim Belushi. Plus, the news with Chris Loxamana. And now, a man who loves mahogany, but is iffy on monogamy. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on a choice. We're get on a mandate. Get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Stone Frame. We love that about you, Rain Max Battle. Oh, yeah. All right. So here's a weird one. I'm walking down PCH the other day. Come across this group. Nice looking guy. His friend. Female. They like come out of the sidewalk then you know kind of catching up to them then you gotta do the move do they feel you mm-hmm. coming up or do you go out in the street and kind of you turn on the thrusters them? and, and put the, walk put, by put the uh, after jets on the after burners go around they felt us coming and they they moved over so i got a hair stuck in my mouth and can you minute your hair stuck in your mouth shouldn't be so off-putting that took a while well, I mean, here we are covered with hair as human beings. You know, guys have beards, full beards, but you don't get a hair in your mouth very often. No. It's this big, wet, sticky thing that's right in the middle of your face. Your body's covered with hair, but then you get a hair in your mouth, and it's like, well, got to pull over. I Things cannot deal with cease. this. Yes. Things need to cease. Like now, the hair I pulled out was... A, Five eighths of an inch long, max, maybe half inch. Just one single hair, one miniature, like like an eyebrow hair. But it made it into my mouth. Crazy how annoying. And that now I got to stop. Yeah. I think we're the only animal that does that. I, I don't think, <laughs> no, I don't think dogs do that. Dogs get they a fucking mouthful it. of hair and they just eat it. Yeah. So I'm walking anyway. You pass by this group. Pass by the group. Walking a little bit. Some point, uh, one of the group members. The fella up front introduces himself, tells me that uh, I may know his brother, um, Brody. He's a Jenner. What? So I may know his brother, Brody Jenner. Then he introduces himself as the oldest of the, the Jenner boys. And I think it's him. I don't know if Brody's second or maybe second or third. And then there's, oh, God, the... Um, there's a third, third Jenner. Jenner. Yeah, he likes the off-road racing. Jenner. Right. And it was like, he's the, was he in the Celebrity Grand Prix with you? Brody was. Brody was. And then the other Jenner, I can't think of his name. He's got a good fucking name. He looks like who he is. His name like Chuck or something. You know what I mean? It's like he's got a real- Chuck Jenner. He's got a real name. He's got a guy, you know, races off-road trucks, has a beard. Bert. <coughs> his name is Bert, Bert Jenner. That's a dude's name. Yeah. So- Brody, I remember going hard into the wall, hard into the wall during one of the Toyota Grand Prix I did and backed it out. And that it's always what, and maybe we can find Brody Jenner going into the wall, Ben, at the uh, Toyota Grand Prix. But it, it's why I get irate when I see people standing outside their car with a little paint traded in the third lane of the 101 freeway. It's yeah. like, you do that Toyota Grand Prix. You see guys go hard into a cement barrier, back it out, and like keep going with just like one <laughs> one one wheel where sparks are coming out. But they're gonna finish the, the race. Bumpers hanging. <laughs> Hang it. You you find Brody Jenner hard into the wall, got back out, finished the race. Like fluids pouring out of the car himself, the sparks. He's a fuck it. I'm going. And that my thing is like He did the last four laps of this race with this fucking car. You could pull 20 feet off to your right and get to the shoulder in your car, which is in much better condition. But anyway. No, I love that. It's like the the end of Cool Runnings. (coughs) Sorry. So the guy starts talking. He's very nice. I I see the resemblance. Looks a little like Brody. And uh, checks out then. He says, uh, and uh, you know, now this is what struck me as interesting. Uh, you know, my dad, uh, Bruce Jenner, I think he said my dad, Bruce Jenner, but then later on referred to his dad as she. Okay. So in his world, and he may be grandfathered into this world. I don't know anyone else that could do it. He would say my dad, and then she lives off of, you know, ocean view 
above Zuma. Because Caitlyn Jenner is so high profile, you can do that. Well, to him, it is his dad. Right. So he gets to say my dad and then say she. Before. And not expect any follow-up questions is what mm-hmm. I'm saying. Like if, if a stranger did that, for like a, your dentist did that. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I would I'd be scared, but I would have follow-up. <laughs> yeah. Follow-up questions. So we walked and we talked and he was nice and he's got a studio there and they, he does music or, or something and podcasting and all that. Totally you, didn't, you didn't bring up the fact that you were on PCH? The uh, the scene of his dad's oh, crime. Oh, God damn. Yeah. Murder or vehicular manslaughter or something yeah. on PCH. Yeah. Maybe so, not. Yeah. Maybe not smart to bring that up, actually. Yeah. I kept playing that one close to the vest. Yeah. But I did talk about his uh, his brother Brody's erratic driving in the Toyota Grand Prix. <laughs> and then, uh, then it was the greatest. This is the greatest hundred feet of sidewalk of my life. So we're like talking and he goes... Uh, did you, uh, did you did you did that thing right? That Toyota Grand Prix a couple times. Did you did you win that? I was like, yeah, I think I won that as a celebrity. <laughs> and he goes, oh, do you oh. you get to come back as a as a as a pro? And I was like, oh yeah, won that yeah, one. Feathered won it. Won that one too. I try to weave it into most conversations I have, but it, it's a little clunky. We've talked about it three times already today. This is him bringing it up. That's cool. Oh, it was awesome. Oh, I guess he crashed and got out of his car at that point. I'm not, I'm thinking of other people that have destroyed their cars. <laughs> yeah. He hit that cement barrier and that cement barrier moved bad. The cement barrier is going to win. The cement barrier <laughs> always, always wins. So yeah. there was that. That was just a side. But I thought it was interesting. My dad and then she. That's a cool run in. Lives up in the whatever. Yeah. Um, and we can get. Caitlin on this show one of those one of these days. I would love to. She calls me on rare occasion and says something that I said or something. And then when I invite her on the podcast, her people are like, what's the pay? And then I'm <laughs> like, that's not how podcasting works. You come on and then you could promote something, but you don't get paid to come on a yeah. podcast. I think they're sort of we pay in promotion. Old school. <laughs> All right. The other thing, uh, just, Caitlin's kind of in trouble right now with the whole sports thing. Oh, really? Yeah, because uh, she says biological men should not be playing in women's sports, and then they're like, "You're you're trans. What are you talking about?" And then she would respond, "Well, I'm a bio- biologically, I'm a man." Right. And I, yeah. So she's she's kind of. It's weird because remember she was beloved, like when her uh, as a Vanity Fair cover came out when she transi- transitioned. And now she's she's the enemy. She's a turf. Yeah. Oh, look. First thing, fuck all these people, because th- these people, their plan is is to agitate. They have no thoughts about m- pr- pr- progress or rights or m- or moving along of you know people, marginalized people. Or all they want to do is agitate. That's all. Yeah. That's all they want to do. And they just keep going until normal people stop. And then when normal people stop, then they accuse them of being close-minded or bigoted or homophobic or whatever. No, right-thinking people understand that women, that men calling themselves women and participating in women's sports is an unfair advantage, and we actually support the women. That's what normal people think. Right. That's what regular people think. So they're fucking nuts. They're loud. They're like showing up everywhere. Now we have to. It is interesting. I mean, it's an interesting time. Then you have to have. Then the Biden administration has to explain that the trans community, that they've got their back and that they stand for them. And it's always like, how much fucking trans talk can we have here? Like what percentage of America are trans or give a fuck? It's crazy. We get obsessed with nothing. Nothing. Right. We just get obsessed with nothing. Meanwhile, we don't have any strategic oil reserves or the borders porous or fucking gas is six bucks a gallon in California or the schools suck. And then we just get sucked into talking trans talk 24 seven. Right. If we looked at the transcripts of Biden's entire presidency. Transcripts. There you oh, go. I did it again. Yes. But yeah, how much would be focused 
how many words and how many how many times are we uh, are we focusing on that subject versus oh get how, Dylan what, Mulvaney what is a, in what to is have a, a beer summit with a beer summit with Biden you know but it, you're you're right like uh, it's it's not so much denying trans people to play sports or trans anything it's it's more you're trying to elevate the women that were competing in the first place and just yes fucking idiots but it doesn't it, look like that so here's what we do. And maybe Biden likes this. I don't know. It's like we're in a house and the house is a mess. And the house is plumbing is shot and the roof is shot and the toilet keeps backing up and there's a vermin infestation in this house, right? And then we go, people like me go, we got to get some copper plumbing in this house or maybe PEX. I'm open to it. Either way, yeah, the old Galvey under. shit's got to go. We got to we got to fix that toilet. It's backing up. We got to get the kitchen. We got to get the counters resurfaced. And then, then somebody goes, "What about that summer dress in the hall closet?" And I go, "I don't know." And they go, "Well, that summer dress in the hall closet not being taken care of we correctly." And that, I go, yeah. "Oh yeah, okay, fine." Are you for summer dresses being abused? I, no, no, no. I want to fix the plumbing. I want to fix the roof. I want to fix the foundation. Then we can talk about the summer dress. Yeah. And they go, no, no, no. Now we're all in on the yeah. summer dress. Adam so Cole hates summer dresses. <laughs> that's right. Then we're going to have all the press conferences and all the news cycles and all the discussions going to be about the fucking summer dress. And there's only one of them. It's in the closet. It's unclear whether it's being abused or not. I don't know. I'm saying we don't have a roof. And we don't have plumbing. So you're and saying like, you hate summer dresses. We're going in on the summer dress. Yeah. That's essentially what we do. Now, what I was guess. The original issue? I forgot. I think <laughs> Biden likes it because everything else, you know, the economy and everything else is such a shit, ho- shit show that they go, let's just focus on the summer dress. But I, I tend to think that's what happens. I think Gavin Newsom does that. I think they pick out shit. We all fucking take the bait. Then we argue about it. Meanwhile, Taxes, inflation, borders, you know, all the shit, you know, whatever, threatening war with China, whatever, Russia. We're all focused on the summer dress. It's like mass misdirection. Like they're like magicians. Like, check out this over here. So you don't have to worry about what I'm doing with my other hand. Yes. So we got that. Um, So everyone is obsessed with trans rights, even though, and, and what are the trans rights? Like, what do people even want? You know I, I, mean? I think it's just, really I what where it all stems from is they just wanted to be recognized and treated fairly and and et cetera and and that's fine right? yeah but you, we can recognize we I, do whatever you want that's fine but don't it but it, it's when they start getting angry and wanting to shove like shove it down our throats like hey we need to be heard and it's like we we hear you like you're there I get it it's yes all right but, I, I I concur. It's all part of, it's agitation. It's not. Yeah, uh, it's that's what like, it is. And we, I, I'm anti-agitation. And then the people that are really fucked up are all the assholes that run the colleges. Because then when somebody, some Riley Gaines, some swimmer who got cheated out uh, of her spot as number one in America because a dude took her spot. She's been very vocal about this. Yeah. And she wants to say something. Then all the assholes go out and shout her down. Yeah. Right. And and threaten her. And, and, and it's a shit show. But then whether it's Stanford or San Francisco, I don't know, state or whatever that was where she went. L- let me just explain something. If somebody shows up to speak at your college and that person is unable to speak because you blow whistles and shout them down. So eventually they have to leave. That's not your students exercising freedom of speech, you assholes. They then they come out with comments like our students uh, uh, peacefully, you know, they they protested and they have the right to protest and we stand behind their right. So your game is you invite alternative viewpoints to come to your campus to speak when they show up, riots and shouting breaks out. And then they have to be escorted by police people into like safe rooms until everyone goes home. And that's free speech. Fuck off. That is not free fucking speech. Free speech is they get to speak and then you can speak. You can speak speak too. Yeah. Yes. 
Oh, but shouting God. down. Oh God! So the it's, other person doesn't speak. That's yeah. It's, it's not all free speech. fucking college camps. So is e- even to um, Anna Kasparian from the Young Turks mm-hmm. is get she's getting a lot of flack because she tweeted last week or a little over that. Uh, quote: "I'm a woman. Please don't ever refer to me as a person with a uterus, birthing person, or person who menstruates. How do people not realize how degrading this is? You can support the transgender community without doing this shit. And it's all degrading. It's all it's." It's all whatever they say you're doing. Like, just the notion of saying, like, I support the black and brown community. Just the idea that you brown, how, who does that include? Guatemalan, Mexican, Honduras, uh, Indian. Like, who is even the brown? Who I like is think even of myself the as brown. brown community? Like, yeah. you've just lumped in 13 nations into the brown <laughs> community. We've got the black it's and the brown. It's like, a broad umbrella. This affects disproportionately low income people and black people. Like, oh, and black people. Like, it's all racist. It's 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 all insane calling someone a birthing person and stuff. Right. It, but it's this all is, degrading. This is the host of the Young Turks saying well, this. this. Eventually, is wild. normal. Here's the whole part. Normal people will wake up and push back. Yeah. So whether she and uh, Dennis Prager and Ben Shapiro disagree on everything, but they do agree on normal. Yeah. And this is abnormal, what you're asking them to do. So you will then make strange bedfellows out of adversaries because you've uh, you've gone so far off the fucking reservation with your abnormal requests that, w- that the right and the left aren't going down with Latinx or Latinx or what birthing people, whatever crazy nonsense you've trotted out have made people on the left feel like you're insane and people on the right feel like you're insane. Yeah. So what do you and Caitlyn Jenner talk about when she calls you? Well, we could talk racing because she's... She took the, you guys talk about the F1 results and stuff. What, like, what do you mean? Well... Oh, what like she'll what, call you? What what she'll do is she'll see me on you know we'll do the Comedy Central roast or something, and she'll call oh, me. Oh, that's right. Or, or she's a she's very conservative, so she'll see a spot on like Tucker Carlson or something, and she'll call like that next day and go, "Hey, I agree with you," oh, you know, nice on, on yeah, whatever. Cool. Right. So that's that's my Caitlyn Jenner, but we'll we'll see if we can. See if we can get her on. Here's yeah, a what, what to save up. I have a depressing theory. I was talking to Dr. Drew about on my ride in today, which was I said to Drew, I used to be able to kind of gauge people, and it was much easier to gauge people back in the day because people moved in kind of a straight line. So you'd go, well, what's this guy want to do? Well, he's a junior agent, so he's going to start off in the mailroom, and then he's going to work his way up, and then one day he's going to get into the corner office. There's going to be made partner American or something dream, like that. Sure. But it's just like there was a straight line. Everything in this country was like, well, you start off as a apprentice or laborer, then you Mail work your room, way to apprentice, yeah. and then you work your way into carpenter, and then you become a journeyman carpenter, and then you become a foreman, and then you There's own your There's an established own, path. Out, there, was, there was a straight line. Yeah. I see a, your average 25-year-old dude now, he's going in a fucking circle. Like, <laughs> I don't know where he's going. I don't know that he's... He even as, as poor and destitute as my childhood was in my early 20s, where it was always a direction. It was like, we're going to go this, and then we're going to get that, and then we're going to make it over here. And it was like, there's a white collar version of it. There's a blue collar version of it. There's a McDonald's version of it. You know, you start behind the grill, then you get behind the counter, and then you make your way up to night manager, and yeah. then the weekend manager. It's like, there's a thing. So we used to have a whole pecking order, and it kind of kept people in a lane. Like it kept people moving because they were motivated because it was linear. Yeah. And there were checkpoints that you hit along the right. way. Right. Right. And now I don't know where anyone's going anymore. Everyone's just kind of hanging out, walking in a circle. And then I was saying, and we're trying to figure out what the fuck's, you know, what a, what's a young dude doing these days? Cause he's not doing the line, the linear line. And I said, well, we would always hear, 
in the black community, when they'd go, the kids are born on the wrong side of the tracks. It's either prison or death. Like, that's all they had in the, waiting for them. So, fuck it, join a gang. Like, wh- why not drop out of high school if your two choices are death and prison? That's the only thing on the table. Then you drop out of high school and you join a gang. Yeah, it's a different All right, line, but that, yeah. that was, that's what we understood. And then, like, well, of course, we can't convince those people to do what's right and stay out of gangs and blah, 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 because they think their future is either death or prison. And then I said, I think... There's a lot of 22-year-olds who essentially think because of climate change, we're done in about nine years. So why get on the treadmill? Like, why go linear? Why? You, yeah, start in the mail room and then die in the mail room because the shit show's going down in a decade. Like, you're, you're never making it to the oh, corner so they gave up. They already gave up. I see that. Like, I, I think that is the white man's version of prison or death. It's climate. A black people don't, the inner city kid doesn't give a fuck about climate. But when I'm saying you go prison or death and they go, oh, I'm not even going to try. Yeah, I'm going to join the, spending all join these the hours. Crowd. Right. So you have Al Gore or whoever explaining you that it's all, all going to be done in about 12 years, maybe nine years, or maybe they said 12 years, five years ago. So we're fucked. What are we doing? You got death. You got climate. You got death. Like why, why bother getting the advanced degree? We're right. all going up in smoke. I think there's a lot of that. I mean, look, I, yeah, kids these days are very easily influenced, and I'm sure some of these messages are coming across as, yeah, what, what's the point? We're what's all going to die. Yes. <laughs> We're all going to die soon. Yes. So, That's I again, sad. I cannot judge people in their path anymore. A lot of circling the airport, not a lot of getting from one destination to the next. Right. All right. We'll take a uh, break, come back do some news and we'll talk to Jim Belushi after that. Simply safe doing some spring cleaning, going to clean your house. Well, how about you protect that clean house with simply safe home security. They've been on board here for over a decade. I've watched the company grow. It's a beautiful story. Uh, I've used it. Dawson uses it. It's peel and sticks, Batteries last up to 10 years, no drilling, no pulling wires, 24-7 professional monitoring. And you can also use fast protect technology to capture critical evidence, verify the threat is real, and get you priority police dispatch. That's important. Costs under a buck a day, less than half of traditional home security systems. You can lock and unlock your doors. You can... um, Do it right from your smartphone. Access cameras, arm and disarm your system from anywhere. Customize your home's perfect system in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com slash Adam. And you go there today and you get a free indoor security camera plus 20% off your order with interactive monitoring. That's simplysafe.com slash Adam. There is no safe like Simply Safe. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. Hey, Adam. Danny here from the great Sacramento, California. First off, I'm an everyday listener. Love what you do. When you guys brought up the topic of parents paying for their adult children's bills, right away I thought of my 24-year-old brother, who has somehow convinced my mom that he's training to become a movie director. The training consists of laying on the couch watching movies while high and drunk all day and unemployed. And she doesn't even question it. Keep up the great work, Ace Man. Talk to you soon. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. Exactly what I'm saying. Hey, can we make this adjustment? I have barely got into it in yesterday's show, but I think I need to get into it a little deeper. More Boda Bag Apparel. You could do a Boda bag ski beanie. <laughs> yeah. It's fucking, you, sp- you split that Boda bag on the seam and pull it over with a little elf hat, the little knob on the top. That's high know? fashion. I go full Boda bag. Boda bag, Boda bag holster. Head to toe. Elbow pads if you skate. <laughs> All right. The Boda bag slippers, not, not a horrendous idea. I don't, I don't like, I don't like my beverages on near anyone's feet. Like, well, it'll cease being a, a functional Boda bag at right. that point. Have you seen those sandals with a bottle opener on the sole? 
the bottom of the thumb. No, but I like it. He, oh. All right, let me ask you this. Um, it, it, it's, it was discussed in yesterday's show because I had that dream about Jimmy Kimmel. And then there was the, the hot chick in your math class who had that dream about you but dreamt you were gay. Yep, traumatized me. I feel like it puts too much pressure on the person that was in the dream where you go, I had a dream about you. My dream was not about Jimmy Kimmel. It's about me. Mm -hmm. He's in it. You co-star. Now I sound obsessed and gay. Yeah. And if you ever have a dream about like a female office worker or something, and you say, I have a dream about you, it's it's Ooh. bizarre, sexual, crosses a line. I think we need to tweak it. No more saying, I had a dream about you. You go, I had a dream with you. You were involved in it. Yeah. But it wasn't you. I'm always the star of my own dreams. Exactly. I got my feet on the ground. I'm first I build in all my dreams. Right. Right. I write, direct, produce, and star, <laughs> and do all my own stunts. Yeah, you should get more credit. In, in my, I am the Tom yeah. Cruise of dreaming. So when you say I had a dream about you, it seems like you stopped and, and were like obsessed or you went to bed focused on that person. Yeah. That's why I was so flattered. I had a, um, so the reason Jimmy was in my dream with me, with me. It's not gay anymore. Not about him. <laughs> the reason he was in it is because during the time in Fresno, uh, Mike August decided to put Jimmy and Danny Two Sheets and uh, Baby Doll Dixon and Cousin Sal on a thread. A little group chat. On a group chat because he wanted them to weigh in <laughs> on Cocaine Bear. Not the movie? the movie. No, no. Mike has been pitching. We get a character called Cocaine Bear. And he said, <laughs> it's going to be funny. And nobody wants to do it. And every comedian has passed. And he, he tried to pitch it for this show. Now, to pitch now it. I feel badly because he's been pitching this for a while. And now this is the first well, people are going to hear he, it. He's gone public. He's it. going public now. So he pitches it. Yeah. He's go, I need a thumbs up or thumbs down. This is a killer idea cocaine bear and then he pitches it to Danny Two Sheets and to Jimmy I have some of the pitches I can read them to you and to and to Dixon oh I don't even okay. some of it is funny but yeah. the point is is of course he's then eviscerated because no one is going to say he, he, does he think he Jimmy's going to sign off on his idea no his comedy idea. he's going to make fun of him yeah and he makes fun of him that's, Ever, what, group, that's what group chats with all dudes are for you're, just, you're supposed to make fun of whoever says something I think Daniel said the only way this thing would like make the air is if you had a competition for worst ideas <laughs> And, and and we did this one. So Mike had to know he was going to be destroyed by yeah. these people, you know? So then I was like, uh, let's not pile on Mike. Oh, no. I'm not, no. I'm not mean-spirited. And he's trying. Yeah. Let's and he was, tr he was traveling. He had to be up like 30, hey guys, come four on. straight hours. Is, is that the end of his pitch? Just cocaine bear? He's got... Or does he get into it? It's nuanced a little bit. <laughs> is it like a resident of West Hollywood with a substance abuse problem? Close, or is yeah. It? No, okay. yeah, it's, well, uh, who knows? So, oh, okay. but I thought, so I wrote, it seems like only yesterday, Jimmy was doing the Chupacabra on Kevin and Bean. Because Jimmy did do the Chupacabra when the Chupacabra was a thing. The goat sucker. Yeah. He's and. Regular voice. Mm, the Chupacabra. Doing the chupacabra on Kevin and Bean is kind of equivalent to doing the cocaine bear on this show. Oh. So I sort of said, well, it's been done yeah. before in, in a Elusive, variation. Elusive, dangerous creature. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, look. Calling if, into the show. If, you, if you've if you signed off on the chupacabra, you kind of have to sign off on the cocaine bear because it's the, it's the same premise, yeah. essentially. Then... I wrote that to everyone on over the weekend. I didn't want to enter the fray. I was just yeah. like, I, I'll, I'll say something. Toss, toss a grenade in and leave. So then 
<laughs> Stupid Mike with his. We took a vote. We took yeah. a vote on the cocaine bear. <laughs> well, now, well, now because he had a backer, he had yeah. some support. No, fun. he didn't. I I waited till everyone else eviscerated him, and then I wrote <laughs> Went to that the one. Ruins and- <laughs> right then, when I got back to L.A. at three in the morning or something, I turned on Netflix, and there's a series called Chupa. That's weird. About the Chupacabra. Mm, they're listening well, somebody to you. made a Chupacabra. There's, I don't know if it's a kid show. I don't know if it's a, a buddy film. I don't know what it is, but there is something on Netflix called Chupa. And I just saw it, and it's about a kid in the Chupacabra. Which I love you guys that can happens. look up. Yeah. Am I am I making this up? Is this brand new? Oh, that's Chupa. That's, that looks like a oh, Chupa. Excuse me. That's a Chupacabra, right? Yes, it's a goat Christian sucker. Christian Slater in it. It's a flying winged goat sucker. It's on Netflix, and it came out over the weekend. April when, 7th, yeah. April 7th is when I was texting to the group about Jimmy and the Chupacabra. You did this. You, you brought this into the universe. So now I got Jimmy all up in my head and Kevin and Bean up ah. in my head, and then I go to bed. And then you I have take a, the you dream. Take a swig from your Boda bag. And you go to the <laughs> I don't know how the Boda bag made it okay. in, but that's when I that's when I had the dream. Yeah. So that's how it go, that's how we got there. I love when things like that happen. Mm-hmm. That's that's why. Uh, yeah. We're, this is all simulation, right? What are the chances that I'm texting about the Chupacabra on the day it comes out on Netflix? I've never seen. I had no yeah. idea it was on Netflix. Any creature. Yeah. You could have named any creature. You named the Chupa. It is. We were were we were we talking about Caitlyn Jenner becoming a woman on this show, or is that with just me and Mike and that Dr. might have been Drew's just you show? and Mike, yeah, yeah. Doctor Drew will always say to me, "Um, it's a movie, by the way, not a series." Too, but Doctor Drew will say to me, "What's happening next? Where are we going? What's going on?" And I'll go, "I don't know. <laughs> Leave me alone." You know, and then he goes, "You know, you know, you always know." Yeah, and I go, "Yeah, kinda." And he goes, "Hey." When uh, Bruce Jenner, you said Bruce Jenner's turned into a chick in 1996, like on the radio. Oh, yeah. And I was like, yeah, I did. And he goes, well, what is it? I know, well, how come? Because he's married at the time. He's got kids. He's the world's greatest athlete. The weird thing to he's say. He's on the Wheaties box. And yeah. I'm like, he's turning into a chick. And, and everyone looked at me and went like, what do you mean he's turning into a chick? Like, first off, that would have been an insane thing to say about anybody back then. But especially the world's greatest athlete. Right. Who was, in fact, married with kids. I just went, I don't know. He's just, he's turning into a chick. And you could go, well, he got his eyebrows done or whatever. But yeah, guys from the Jersey Shore did that too. Mm-hmm. Like I, there was something. And so he was like, what is it? And I was like, that's what I was feeling. I was just feeling like he's turning into a chick. And then people go, you mean he's gay and i go no i didn't feel he was gay I, I i didn't feel anything i just went he is turning into a chick and that's what i said could have been in 97 yeah and i said that and everyone just looked at me and went what are you talking about right you're 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 a reader of nuance i think yes um you when like you brought this up before but that asian guy on the plane who the asian doctor who mm-hmm. got dragged off the plane mm-hmm. everyone was outraged i was uh, all over the news like every late night host they but you were the only one that said no this guy's a dick and there's something going on and even when you said that on air here i cringed i was like dude you can't be saying that like everybody is praising this guy and has this guy's back and you said you went out and said this guy's a dick weeks later story comes out he was being a dick of course yeah so it's just it's, it's interesting that you can point those things out 20 yeah so i made the prediction in october 1998 that he was becoming a woman well 25 years ago yeah you so there it. we go and you you also predicted trump's presidency <laughs> i said the date on that one too <laughs> yeah you said the year i was kind of making a joke but i did call the year yeah. all right but never listen to me anybody never listen if I start talking to you about uh, why Purell is bad for you, make sure you don't listen. Yeah. Never listen. Sorry. We uh, found the audio. Jesus Christ. How did we find the audio that fast? <laughs> uh, I'm going out with Bruce Jenner, who's become a woman, by the way. But 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you've seen him lately, he's slowly becoming a woman. It's very bizarre that the guy won the uh, triathlon 20 years ago. Decathlon. Actually, uh, yeah. Decathlon is becoming a woman. <laughs> but he, he really is, if you've seen Bruce Jenner. He is becoming a woman. Oh, they're, they're taking you liter literally in there. I, it, it is the most bizarre thing in the world that a, that a guy, uh, Brett, do you know anything about this? That a guy who is considered the world's greatest athlete. I mean, that's what you are when yeah. you are the decathlete winner of the Olympics. And he set a record and everything. He's like being so, so, so slowly becoming a woman. I don't know if you've seen him. Uh, no. You think fat or something? He's had like a lot of weird plastic surgery, and he's like plucked his eyebrows in a weird way, and he wears like a little rouge or something, and he he's starting to look like Liberace's boyfriend. <laughs> that was ninety what ninety eight ninety eight. That's a weird statement. Well, obviously he was Bruce Jenner at the time was doing something that caught my attention. But I'm always in a sea of people who are like, have you seen Bruce Jenner? Nope. <laughs> that's all That's all I do is I go, do you see what's going on with this thing? And they go, nope. Yeah. That's 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 Moving my on. world. That's my life. I just start, I start obsessing on things. And then everyone around me goes, I don't know what you're talking about because I have no idea. And by the way, if there were four people in that room, four people would have went, I don't know what you're talking about. And there were 250 people in that room. All 250 would have went, I don't know what you're talking about. That's all I do is I tell people shit. They tell me I'm wrong or they just go, I don't know what you're talking about. And then later on, whatever I said was happening happens. And then they forget about the part where they told me I was wrong. Yeah. But 25 <laughs> years ago, I, well, I couldn't have been more clear than me saying he's turning into a woman. Right. Yeah. And I wasn't saying he's going gay. And I wasn't saying he's got to have like a midlife crisis or he's gotten too much surgery done. Or he, he looks weird. You know, he, you know, when a guy's yeah, you could have 50, went a bunch of got, different ways. No, I, I said turning into a woman. Yeah. Which is precisely what he's done. I wonder what it was. I mean, there's probably, you probably couldn't even remember, but I wonder what. Well, there are plenty of like record producers and stuff like that that got a little too much work done on their face and looked a little weird or their eyebrows a little too thinned out or but for, something. But I never said turning into a woman. I just said it got some bad work done yeah. or whatever. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. Like, I wonder what it was to have you come out with that statement. That, that let, me, let me explain life to you, son. Please, I've been waiting. I am so neutrally buoyant about everything that the slightest wind can move me hard in a direction. Everyone else Poetic. has their fucking feet planted on the ground and they're dug in all the time and you can't get them to move. I just kind of float. And if you just go, Bruce is a woman. I'll go, I'll start floating the other side of the room. Everyone else is planted. Right. They got their feet down. They, well, you know why? Because they know what they know. I know what I know. Here's where my feelings are. I know oh, what I they're... See. So they plant, and I float. And when you float, slightest breeze of information that happens upon you will move you a country mile. And then I go, this is what's happening. Then the people who are planted plant harder because they have to combat my thoughts for some reason. I, I don't know why <laughs> they have to argue with me all the time, but, but they got to go, like, now they have to dig in. And now they're more dug in, and now they're fucked up. And they, they can't have the, the feelings and the instincts anymore because they're dug in. It's like, it's like a religion. It's like, I know what I know. Yeah. How, do, how does one get into a mindset like that then? You have to realize that you don't know things inherently. Like you can, you can learn things, but you just don't know things. Other people do a lot of, I know what this guy's yeah. thinking, I know what that guy's thinking. Also, so you're saying like, accept your ignorance. Like, accept so. that you don't know things. Okay. And people are way too forgiving with themselves. Like, here's how I feel. Here's what I know. You don't know shit. Most people are fucking idiots and their instincts are bad. So you got to get buoyant. You got to kind of float around and you go, go, I don't know what's going on, but I am going to collect data. Yeah. Like a Chinese balloon. I'm just going to do a figure eight over Caitlyn Jenner. And I'm just going to see like what data. So I'm seeing Caitlyn Jenner and it's moving me greatly. 
Other people are going, he says bad plastic surgeon, or who cares? Your Adam floated off too. Most people don't even know. Then it's like he grew his hair out a little bit. What's the deal? What's yeah. the big whoop? You know what I mean? They're factoring in too much. What they really do is they give themselves way too much credit. They they just they they don't realize how fallible they are. They don't realize how bad their batting average is. They move from one thing they were arguing about that they were wrong about to the next thing they were arguing about they were wrong about. You got to get buoyant. You got to get in the middle. And then when you get in the middle and you kind of float a little and you get buoyant, then you can suss out things like COVID much faster than other people who are on the ground. Anchored in. Anchored in, dug in, making a point. You know, that's what you, that, how they end up being wrong for so long. So just float a little. And I'll tell you the key to everything. You have to... You have to work motivation in. You have to, you have, motivation needs to be worked into everything. Like, it's like, and, and you have to have also like factor in some numbers every once in a while. Like, those young kids were harassing dolphins. Like, how fast does a spinner dolphin swim? How fast does a 17 year old from Idaho swim? Yeah. Okay, now I know it's not a story. You wanna see the video? No, I don't. <laughs> I, 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 I've, I've done the math. You have to be able to factor some. Now, what do people do? They go, those kids were harassing the dolphins. And they go, they dig in. They go all in. And they dig in. That's the problem. Yeah. You've got to float. You can't, you can't dig in. You're going to be wrong about almost every news story if you dig in. Right. That's. just Yeah, be willing to float. Be willing to just float. Around. And then once you're floating, just, just like a balloon, just a little bit of information. Yeah, it's, it's enough to move you across the room. So my little bit of Bruce <laughs> Jenner information was enough to get me go hard to the room, and everyone else was just like, eh, "It's grown this era." Yeah, <coughs> oh, yeah, you, you notice things a little more, <coughs> right? Our, Which would be awesome. I know. Like if, we were, if, if 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 people understood, I noticed them. And then oh, well, ask we'll me never my give you credit. On. Drew does. Drew <laughs> goes, you notice everything, so tell me what's next. Yeah. Uh, well, also, Drew, Drew's wife's really into psychics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what, and so maybe Drew feels like maybe there's a supernatural <coughs> thing. No, it's on. the opposite of that. <laughs> All right, so let's get into some news. In Australia, there's an OnlyFans star, and she took up uh, some advertising on a large billboard at uh, one of the intersections in uh, the Perth suburb of Osborne Park. And people aren't happy with it. So we, we have the picture of the billboard here. So it's a it's a picture. It's her uh, handle and then a picture of her in a bikini kind of on all fours there, a QR code and the OnlyFans logo and the Instagram logo. It's just it's brand advertising for her, but people are like, what are you doing? Kids see this. Is she a little bit thick? Or am I making that up? Ben saying yes. Are porn stars? I, I was like watching the news today, and I'm like, prostitutes and migrants crossing the border are now husky. Oh, that's thick a, is a thing. It's, that's a bad sign. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It is. It's a. It's weird. Yeah. That all those. Like, it's like my pappy used to say. Mm. You don't got the dick for thick. <laughs> you got to have some chode on you to handle thick. See, he had it too. He was very buoyant when he figured that out. Yeah, you, yeah. you don't. You got to have yourself something in the in the in the subterranean parking garage down there too. Uh, yeah, she's chunky, bosomy, uh, curvy. Yeah, <laughs> too thick. I, I listen. Too thick. All right. Anyway. Well, anyway, so she her her statements like, look, I'm in a bikini. Kids are going to see people in a bikini if they decide to move forward with it and go to this. By the way, if you go to OnlyFans, you have to show them your license. There, there's actually quite a thick security wall to be able to see any of her content if you wanted to go find it. But if you want to vote in Georgia, you don't need a license. But you want to go to OnlyFans, you need a license. <laughs> you need a license, fans, man. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, All so, right. yeah, so it's uh, people are really upset about about her billboard there. But look, it's advertising. So there you go. Yeah. I don't care. So Dawson, I'm upset that she's thick. Yeah, <laughs> Dawson. There's another high speed chase over the weekend. This is Dawson's favorite thing. But this one was interesting because during the high speed chase, someone threw a puppy out the window. They put this pu- a puppy in a, a Michael Kors designer handbag, mm. and then just threw the puppy out the window. 
The puppy is unharmed, completely unharmed, totally safe. The cops <laughs> rescued this puppy. Um, there's a picture of this very cute dog. And uh, so th- it's now this dog's with the uh, police department. They're saying so many people are reaching out trying to adopt this dog after the story came out. Um, it is yeah, not- but they want to make so, sure the bag comes with it. So wait a minute. Did they, the person who did it, was it a carjacking I'll, I'll thing? Yes, okay, it was. So. Um, so they were, this they were, was someone else's puppy, Chevy not the person Av- who threw it out the window. Unclear, actually. It, okay. It's still an ongoing investigation, but it was a Chevy Avalanche the guy was driving, and he was, uh, he's also, uh, he was wanted for attempted murder and carjacking, so they're chasing this guy down. He goes into a getaway car mm. and jumps into that, and now he's in a car with two other women. Mm. So now there's three people in this car. Oh, at, well, he throws a puppy out, gets into the getaway car. He's in the car with three other women. They uh, eventually get stopped in a neighborhood. They all jump out of the car and try to hoof it, which never does. It, how often does that work out? Um, they eventually get caught by the police and they surrender. And um, yeah, so you have the getaway car, two women, and the guy. Well, people are definitely more upset about the dog than murdering or carjacking. I think that's if why know- this was a story. I don't think we would have even heard about this had it not been a puppy thrown out the window. Did they throw it out the window or did they drop it out the window? Because that bag looks in decent shape and so is the puppy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. This is this is my buoyant Toss, brain once quote, again. The quote was, tossed from the suspect's moving vehicle. At what speed? Two miles an hour. Yeah. Whatever speed those high school guys were chasing the dolphin. <laughs> That's relative, yeah. I guess, I mean, this puppy looks untouched. The bag looks pretty unscathed too. Yeah. But, uh, look, I'm not supporting it. I'm just saying, watch the headlines, everybody. Be careful. Thrown, you know, they'll say, like, thrown out of a speeding car. from pickup in high-speed LAPD. Right. There was a high-speed LAPD chase. The puppy was let out, flung, dropped, or whatever, but not during the high-speed Hey, they need my clicks, man. Why don't we have, there's no footage of this? No. I can find any, maybe. But there's can. footage of the high speed chase, right? I would. Hope, there's a picture of the avalanche, the Chevy Avalanche. No, but there kind of has to be footage of the high speed they, they chase. They always so put their every local in the news air. network yeah. went to it. At the I time. couldn't find it. If if there really? was footage, no. All right. Anyway, yeah, I will adjust it and say there was a high speed chase. The puppy right. was in the car. And it was thrown out of the car, but not during the high speed chase. Yeah. Also, was this in Los Angeles? Yeah. Or okay. Yeah. See, then it certainly made the air. Mm-hmm. That's why I, th- I was hoping you would have saw it. I mean, KCAL 9 and KTLA, they love this they're shit. all yeah. over it. I, I don't even need to they be They will up. preempt Judge Judy yeah. for a high-speed car chase. I don't oh, even have yeah. to subscribe to Police Scanner. I just I just asked Dawson about a high-speed chase. He runs right. in, turns on the TV whenever there is one. All right, what um, else? Oh, so let's talk movies. So The Little Mermaid's being remade, live action. It, it's, uh, it's already had its own share of controversy because Ariel is going to be black, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So now... The songwriters of the of the songs in the original movie, they're working on this one, and they're changing the lyrics to include consent. Mm. Yeah, so you you like The Little Mermaid. I remember you talking mm-hmm. about it once. Yeah. yeah. So there's a song called Kiss the Girl. Mm-hmm. Right? And uh, some of the lyrics into that are, uh, it's when Sebastian Ariel's crab pal mm-hmm. sings, quote, Yes, you want her. Look at her. You know you do. Possible she wants you, too. There's one way to ask her. It don't take a word, not a single word. Go on and kiss the girl. Mm-hmm. I remember that tune. Yeah. Yeah. So now they're gonna. They, it's unclear what they're gonna change these lyrics to, but they, the songwriters did say they are changing it to for more consent. Um, also, the song "Poor Unfortunate Souls" has been revised. This is when uh, Ursula is singing, and um, the lines are: "The Ursula is the bad guy." Ursula sings. Quote, lines that might make young girls somehow feel that they shouldn't speak out of turn, even, oh, oh no, sorry, that was his quote. The, the, the lines are, quote, the men up there don't like a lot of blabber. They think a girl who gossips is a bore. Yet on land, it's much preferred for ladies not to say a word. And after all, what is idle babble for? You dumb whore. Um, all right. Let <laughs> they're, me exp- that, they're changing that line for yes. sure. Yes. All right. Let me explain what's going on floating as i do (laughs) i am telling you we are living in a time where puppies are being thrown out of moving cars 
school shootings are going down left and right. We got fucking drag queen story hour. The border's a porous mess. The economy's going to the gutter. We are like China's eating our lunch. Like we are completely coming undone as a society, but focused on the weird minutia yeah. and the stuff that would say you lived in a perfect society with no problems if this is what you're focusing on. Yeah, you would this, want these problems. Yes, yes. These it, to be your main problems. You want it to be these to be your main problems. You want this to be your main problem. And this is, I, I don't know if it's in reaction to our society turning into Sod- Sodom and Gomorrah, like people just being stabbed in the streets and stepping through human shit in San Francisco, like crazy drug addict population, you know, homelessness. Like, is, is it is it a reaction to that? Like, is it my Gavin Newsom theory where he's like um, homeless everywhere, taxes everywhere, businesses fleeing, fucking trash everywhere, graffiti everywhere, and all commercial trucks are going to have to be electrically powered by 2033, where you go, oh, is that what we're talking about? <laughs> we're, we're talking about utopia in dystopia? Yeah. Is it intentional that... We're doing more and more sort of utopian talk in the middle of dystopia. Yeah, that makes it more dystopian almost, right? Ooh, you're probably right. Yeah. All right, we need to take a break because uh, Jim Belushi is going to join us yeah. right after this. Fast-growing trees from shade to fresh fruit. Breathe some life into your backyard. Do it this spring with fastgrowingtrees.com. They're experts curate thousands of plants so you'll find the perfect fit for your unique climate their plant experts are always available to help keep your plants healthy through the season no long lines or hauling heavy plants around order online and your plants are shipped to your door in just a few days this is a great company i use them i'm a fan it's you don't realize what it does not only for the air, for the environment, whatever, but yeah, get some trees going, clean up the air, and get a little uh, get a little dwarf lemon going and have some iced tea. Plus, they have a 30-day alive and thrive guarantee so you know everything will look great and be fresh right out of the box. It's fast-growing trees. Am I right, Dawson? Just over 1.5 million happy Fast Growing Trees customers. Go to fastgrowingtrees.com slash Adam now to get 15% off your entire order. Get 15% off at fastgrowingtrees.com slash Adam. In celebration of Jim Carolla's upcoming 92nd birthday, here's a list of 92 things Jim Carolla has never done. Number 45, built a sandcastle. Just one of 92 things Jim Carolla has never done. Let's get back to the Adam Carolla Show. Jim Belushi is joining us now via Skype. Growing Belushi, season three, new episodes uh, on Wednesdays on Discovery Channel and streaming on Discovery Plus. Good to speak to you again, Jim. Oh, Adam, it's always a pleasure, man. I'm sorry to make it up to Washington that time. I had a conflict. I'd love to be in studio with you sometime. Well, we'll do it as soon as your uh, schedule will, will allow. But this is the next best thing. Yeah, yeah, it's good to be with you. I never thought about this, but you, you, Jim and John Belushi, like how lazy were your parents when it came to the naming? Like, <laughs> it just felt like they just went, Jim, John, we're done. Yeah. I'm going to stay up all night looking Jim, at a book. Wait a minute. Jim, John, Bill. Oh, Bill. I mean, Bill, too, my younger brother. Yeah, they were really lazy. My, my, my son's got two kids, and their names are Silviana and Tazio. I mean, how creative is that? Yeah. No, I I got the same thing. I got the, I got the nephews named Finn and all the fancy whatever, and I just feel like your parents didn't give a shit. They're just like... Well, yours, too. Adam, I mean, my dad's name was Adam, and my nephew's name is Adam. I mean, they really didn't give a shit. Yeah, you're right. My dad's name is Jim as well, so maybe he was just sort of paying it forward is that in the lazy parents department. parents would name their kids? Like, hey, what's the most common name 
out there. Like, yeah. They were kid that. Well, Bo- but, but Belushi, see, Corolla is an Italian name, but you put Adam in front of it and people don't know it's an Italian name. If you name me Jim right. Corolla or James Corolla, it sounds Italian. But Belushi, I don't know what people, did they know you're Albanian? Like, did they know what to uh, make of you? you? Know, for many years, people uh, thought I was Italian, but uh, I think they know I'm Albanian now pretty much. Actually, <laughs> the, the last episode of Growing Belushi, we go to Albania and meet with the prime minister about discussing cannabis uh, growing in Albania. So they'll know I'm Albanian after that episode. Where is it prevalent uh, around the world? Like what's Western Europe? We hear about California. We hear about Oregon, Washington and stuff like that. But I don't know what's going on in yeah, Hungary. Uh, Hungary, I don't know what's going on either. Uh, the Netherlands or, you know, Denmark, Amsterdam, that that area has been, well, for, for decades, they've been uh, breeders, great breeders of uh, strains. Uh, some of the greatest geneticists of cannabis have gone there to breed their strains. So they, they really are the ones that are most prolific about the strains themselves. The usage, um, you know, it's pretty it's still pretty illegal in the EU. You know, there's some, some you know, minimal crime in Spain if you're caught. Uh, but there's a lot of growth going on in Greece, uh, Macedonia. Oh, now Albania wants to start up for the uh, export of medical cannabis. So and we really believe that Germany is coming along really quickly and Spain will follow and hopefully England and so forth. So it's a slow process, but it's it's happening. What was your relationship with weed growing up, where you grew up, uh, how you grew up? Yeah, I was like a hippie. You know, I was I was a weird guy. I was an athlete. I was a tackle. I was acting. Uh, I was shooting pool at the pool hall, drinking, and I was kind of a hippie. I was. I got busted for pot three times at high school. So, at the school? No, no, not at the school, but in the town. But you know, I went to the rock festivals. You know, I was sixteen, and you know, we, you know, pulling joints and doing acid and all this stuff that you do. You know. Did your parents know what to make of you? Because I know they're, they had the real immigrant mentality, right? Well, uh, maybe this will give you an idea. I went to a rock festival one time one, that summer. I was gone for three, four days, and my parents didn't even know it. Oh, really? Like, how old <laughs> so were you? Did, did they have a sense of me? Maybe if they had a sense of me, I wouldn't be an actor looking for love. Mm-hmm. I had no idea what I was or who I was until I kind of, I worked with my dad. I mean, I love working with my dad in the restaurant business, but until John and I got, you know, kind of famous, kind of opened their eyes, you know, like, Hey, who are you two? <laughs> oh. yeah. yeah. No, it's such a, it's, it's such a bizarre thing that I think about every day, which is I was almost invisible to my parents and the, right? the amount of, I had this very funny moment that maybe only I appreciated, but uh, Vince Vaughn used to be my neighbor for like 10 minutes. And we decided one day that the husbands and the wives should walk the short distance to the local eatery and we'll take the Vons out to dinner. And, you know, we walked there and it was a lot of talk about the kids and you got to get them involved early and they need a coach, you know, they're going to play soccer. They want to compete. They need a coach, you know, they need to do private lessons, blah, blah, blah. We went and had dinner, uh, more kid talk on the short walk home. And when we got in front of our houses, I said, we have just talked more about our kids in three <laughs> blocks then my fucking family talked about both their kids in 18 years. <laughs> Do you understand? In three blocks, I talked more about your kids oh, in three man. fucking blocks than my parents talked about me and my sister combined in a lifetime. We just uh, did that it. That is the truth. I mean, the only way I got attention was I, got, I had to get arrested because they were called to pick me up at the jail. So, I mean, it was like... Yeah, I'm here. It, it yeah, is, no, it, you're right, man. They didn't. They didn't really know. But they, you know, 
I, I, they were harmless people. They were just caught, caught up in their own drama of survival, you know? Yes, they were busy they surviving. They were busy surviving and providing. My and, dad, you know, yes. worked really hard. They worked 14 hour days and. Well, also, money wasn't invisible like it is now. So putting a roof over your head and putting a meal on the table, that went a long way. Like yeah. you survive. They don't need yeah. to be interested in all your schoolmates or what your yeah. hopes or dreams are. You got a roof over your head. There's a heater yeah. and there's some food. That, yeah, you know, my mom once said that, you know, having children was enough for my dad. He, that was enough. That he did that. So, and then moving, you know, it was just part of what you do opposed to, you know, watching the emotional growth. Although, you know, when I was older, my dad was really quite, quite beautiful with me. But So he was around long enough to see all the success. Oh, yeah. And he had no idea. Again, immigrant guy. And again, in this episode of Growing Evolution, we literally go back to the village that my dad grew up in. It's a peasant little village in the mountains of Albania. He had like, a, you know, eighth grade education, and he had no idea of what what we, me and John were doing. I mean, John took him on a one of those golf carts and gave him a tour of the Universal Studio and going into offices for meeting. And my dad just sat like this, you know. He had no idea what was going on. You poor guy. Did he have a thick accent? Yes. So he didn't talk a lot because he was very self-conscious about it. Can you do an impersonation of him? Well, you know, uh, that cheeseburger, cheeseburger sketch yes. of John? Yes. He is doing my dad and my Uncle Paul. Because my dad and my Uncle Paul were partners in the cheeseburger, cheeseburger restaurant called Olympia Lunch in Logan Square in Chicago. So when John was doing the breathing and the sighing and the looking... That was my dad. And then when he was talking, like, come on, come on, come on, come on. That was my uncle. So my dad really didn't talk much, but he would. <laughs> it's so crazy. And you know, it's, you know, it's crazy. It's like when I hear about somebody dying, I'm trying to think, I think it was uh, Joe Frazier. I think they said Joe Frazier. When Joe Frazier died, recently they said son of a sharecropper and i thought huh. we're never going to hear that ever again that we're done yeah, Every, everybody everyone who died up until 10 minutes ago could have been the son of a sharecropper now it's uh, the guy was a programmer yeah or he's an instagram <laughs> model or something i don't None know of a do. son of a podcaster uh it's crazy but your dad grew up like the way your dad grew up m may have well just been 500 years ago. Forget about 80 years ago or whatever. Exactly. 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 My dad was a, you know, just a peasant man and got to America. And, you know, I, I, uh, I, he just wanted to be an American. And he was, one time I was talking to him, he was, I just want to, be, what's the matter that I just want to be an American. I said, you are an American. I just said, you know, you're separated, you know, uh, from your wife. The mafia took your restaurants away from you. Um, uh, your son has been married to three times. Uh, your daughter is uh, her husband disappeared. Uh, John died of a drug overdose. I said, you hit all the American statistics, right. Dad. Yeah, it's the so dream. I didn't think about it that way. <laughs> I heard if you hit four of those, you get your green card like that. That's right. Immediately. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you said you have a brother, Bill? Yes. What's Bill up to? I don't know. We're not talking of late. Mm. Mm. Is there... I even, you know, I've, I've dabbled in this a little bit, you know, where one of the siblings gets pretty successful and the other one not as much. And sometimes they just ask for favors and other times they resent you. And, but this is double trouble because you got you and John. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's an unusual situation for him to go through. I'm sure. I think there's a little bit of all that in there. You know, he was kind of, 
he was kind of invisible. And I, I, he said that, and I was like, we were all invisible, Billy. What are you talking about? We weren't visible until we were on TV, and they can actually see us. Right. <laughs> so did he have any aspirations about getting into show business? No, no, no. It's just a different direction. Yeah. Just, yeah. I know it is, it is funny. But oh, he was a sheet, sheet metal guy. Oh, really? Yeah. HVAC guy, did some yep. flus and Absolutely. things like that. Yep. I know sheet metal. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> this is that this is the interesting phenomenon. When you grow up in a home where you're kind of invisible, and then you grow up in that same home along with your sibling. And then at some point your sibling becomes an adult and claims that they grew up in that home, but you grew up in some amusement park where you were hailed as a as a genius and worshipped. Uh, because of your talent. It's like, no, no, same home, same, same people, home. same people. By the same. way, <clears throat> but that would make you the worst parent ever, right? Just that, oh, you're the world's greatest parent to the one kid, and then you're horrible to the other kid. <laughs> but that's how that kid experienced it. Yeah. And they're like, your dad, oh, he was always your favorite. And so he didn't go to any football games. He didn't save for college. Oh. He didn't buy me a car. He did, he did the exact same shitty parenting he did on you, he did on me. Oh yeah, my dad did. Buy, my dad did buy me a car. What? Old uh, Oldsmobile eighty eight, nineteen sixty four Oldsmobile eighty eight. Man, I love that car. He got it for four hundred and twenty five dollars. I mean, it was. I love that car. Delta eighty eight. It was all right because really, those men were about, and I'm this way too, about work. Mm-hmm. It's all about work. All right. And in order to get to know my dad. I had to go to the restaurant and work with them. And that's how I got to know my dad, working side by side with him. Even though we didn't talk, at least we were in action together. And for men to be in action together, that is their relationship. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I really did get to know him and love him during that time, even though we never had any kind of serious talk. I remember one time I got in a fight with my wife. And he was there, poor guy. And we walked outside. And I'm like cussing. And I said, "Ah, I should have just gotten an Albanian woman, you know? And he goes, you think Albanian women are any different than American women? They're all women, Jimmy. (laughs) That was uh, the big advice he gave. (laughs) Speaking of working together, I'm interested in your uh, reclaimed wood, mortise, and tenon construction, your, your... your cabin, your getaway home, your you know. getaway home. Yeah. I want to know about that process. Yeah, that was, uh, we really had some great craftsmen that put that home together. It was, it was, it was a little expensive, but it was such a beautiful process. I've got all this reclaimed wood. I got the, these beams in my ceiling that are from a, a cotton gin in North Carolina from 1868, long leaf pine. Uh, I get these, you know, uh, what do they call them? Scarf cuts to bring these beams together. I got wood from uh, these potato barns in Idaho. You know, these barns were 50 years old and they reclaimed that wood and it was just pine. But when you put a clear coat on it, all these rich colors come out. This this house has such a nice feeling because the, the spirit of that wood that you I mean you look up at it and to me they tell stories. I can't take my I lay down in bed and look at the wood and it's like just gorgeous. It's a it's a wonderful place. Wonderful, wonderful place to be in. Well they they say, and I guess it's true, you count the rings to see how old the, the tree is. So it's like they do tell a story, a, a pretty exact story about it. here's how old I am. Yeah. By by counting the rings. And and I agree, like when you it's sort of the difference when you look up in a modern structure, you would see a glue lamb beam or paralam beam, you know, the big spans were done by a whole bunch of wood pulp that was like bound together. Right. Kind of the, the difference between bologna and steak. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah, you're, yeah. you're you're getting a Kobe beef <laughs> cut yeah. nicely marbled, and this other shit is kind of spam. Yeah, like, yeah, it'll it'll work, but it's not it's not that. Well, there was this guy in in uh, in the Rogue Valley up there in Oregon. I think it's called Rogue Valley Lumber, even. 
And he was really a collector of wood. He would go to people's barns and say, we'll build you a new barn if you'll let me take this wood. And those guys would go, yeah. He, when we were walking in the back, we were looking at beams. He goes, I bet you want that beam. I said, why, why, why? Look at that's old. He goes, I got that from a water tower in Milwaukee. And I said, I don't want anything near the Green Bay Packers in my house. <laughs> Bears fan. I didn't want anywhere else but in Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> but he collected from Missouri to North Carolina. He has an ear to all these different people. And he collects this great wood. And to walk through that wood and select the wood for the home was quite a lovely process. No, lovely man. Lovely man. I I agree. I've been in a few places. Jimmy has a place, got a lot of reclaimed, you know, I, I don't know. It's a vibe. And and yeah. I'm not even a, I'm not, you know, in a feng shui, but there's just a difference between carpet squares and reclaimed barn when you're walking on it. It's just a different vibe. And the thing about the vibe is the vibe adds up. Like, yeah, you got a very, little, well put, very well put. You start doing the walls, you do the beams, you do the ceilings, you do the truss, you do the joists, you start doing the flooring, and before you know it, it is added up to a pretty big vibe. No nails. No nails. A nail in my house. Oh, I, I'm sorry. The guest, uh, the guest quarters was you know just stick and sheetrock. Right. Uh, but the the master suite and the the main part of the house, not a nail in it. It's, it's beautiful and it sits so well. These guys just gave it, gave it just to make this wood meet. It's beautiful, beautiful. I don't know if you got a vibe from those guys, but I have my theory is that all the people that are sitting in the cubicles with the air conditioning are all going insane, and all the guys who work with their hands aren't. Like the guys who are actually on their feet outside sweating putting things together like those you know, guys Adam, Adam, Adam that's why I I, I I mean I fell into this place in Oregon I mean once I got there and once I built that home on the river and the farm behind me came up for sale and I bought that and then it's like I that old work of maybe that peasant thing for my dad and those villages pushing plows I don't know but to be on this farm and I, I work the soil with the cannabis constantly we're constantly working with the soil the nutrients the irrigation the pest control it's just it's grounded me so much in these last few years i just love being back on earth you know mother earth father son the water the water spirits the tree spirit i all i'm like this crazy <laughs> spiritual guy now because i've been locked into the ground when were you furthest away from this in your in your world oh i think most of the time yeah according to jim season two <laughs> yeah yeah i mean that, in the minute no, no, that was a, that was a grounding run that was lovely that according to jim run was really great but yeah, well, you know the industry we're in. You know, it's even now, right now, the show is out. On, you know, we opened last, we premiered last Wednesday. Did very well, by the way, thank God. But waiting up until that moment, you know, you're vulnerable. This, this show has my name on it. I'm in it. We write it because we improvise it. You know, I got my brother in it. I got my son in it. It's, the vulnerability is so huge. It makes you a little crazy. You need to get back to the soil just to go, oh, earth. There are things bigger than me and my worries and vulnerability. Well, also, when you're laying in bed and you're staring up at that beam that's 200 years old, you realize some other guy had a use for that beam 150 years ago. He's long yeah. gone. We don't know who he is. And it, it kind of, there's a lot of perspective there. Yeah. And I, yeah, that really is. It is. It gives you, I mean, as morbid as it is, you ever find yourself walking through a graveyard, it'll give you, like it'll ground you up yeah. like quick. You'll get grounded. You won't be depressed. It, you'll just have no. perspective. You know what yeah. I mean? And yeah. so, you know, your home's like a tree graveyard. <laughs> <laughs> In a way, yeah, I guess it is. 
And I, that, spirits around me. That stuff. Yeah, there were Native Americans on that land that I was on. Uh, across from where I am is Table Rock, which was a ceremonial center for the Native Americans that lived in the Southern Rogue Valley. And, you know, you can feel, you can feel it. You can feel the power of some kind of spirits that are running through there that are beautiful, beautiful, powerful spirits. Um, so it's right, great to grow cannabis right in that, that section because of that vibe. You know, it's just a really... Speaking, all speaking of interesting vibes, uh, Aykroyd, Dan Aykroyd, I know yeah, he's Danny. in the show as well. Uh, yeah. I'm a huge fan of Dan Aykroyd's. Um, Me too. Yeah, everyone should be. <laughs> I, in a weird way, maybe he doesn't get his due, even though he does get his due. But, I mean, his work on SNL is unparalleled to me. It's kind of Phil Hartman and him. I like the two Adam. guys. Because he's he's like a, a close friend, and we've been doing the Blues Brothers, you know, concerts all over for twenty five years. I dance with this big Canadian man up on stage. I forget where his sense of legacy because he's a friend. Right. But when we walk out on stage as the Blues Brothers, people like instantly stand up and applaud. <laughs> I mean, it's like, oh, that's right. This is Basomatic. Right. This, <laughs> this is Ghostbuster. This is Blues Brother. This is this is Dean Eggert. He's a legend, man. And I just for, I forget, you know. He's a big deal guy. Yeah, I am. i always. I mean, I obviously grew up marveling at him because he was such a like a a wordsmith. He was so clean. Kind of, kind of Dennis Miller ask and like a tat a rat a tat 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 like when he was doing, um, when him and Steve Martin were doing the two wild and crazy guys, the Festronk brothers. Steve Martin was kind of clownish and kind of all over the road with it. Dan Aykroyd was precise. Yeah, like he sounded like he was from wherever the uh, Festronk brothers were from. His was a much cleaner accurate theatrical version of what Steve Martin was doing, sort of a jumbled caricature of yeah. this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Danny, Danny owns his characters deeply, but you know, that was a second city training. Also back then the improvisation, the training was all about the character and the character relationship and the jokes will follow. And so the notes we used to get from Del Close were much more, acting notes and following the truth of the scene opposed to where's this joke. Mm -hmm. And and so it was about character work, you know, and Danny just, you know, he's just got a mind. And John had uh, an incredible mimic, mimic throat, you know, I mean, he can mimic anything and Danny too. So they would blend some of their, like Danny would go, I go, where did you get Nixon? You know, and he goes, ah, uh, Al Jolson. Mm. Oh, Al Jolson. And then he would do Al Jolson and turn it right into Nixon. So he had basis of his characters vocally, and then mentally he would just zoom, zoom into the detail. Terrific. I want to ask, uh, we need to take a quick break. When we come back, though, I do want to talk about your SNL days as well uh jim belushi hang with us take a quick break be right back right after this hey it's adam carolla is your vehicle no longer stopping like it used to or does it squeal shake or grind when you break don't miss spring break deals at o'reilly auto parts now through april 25th you can get 15 percent off when you buy a set of break best select or Import Direct brake pads and two rotors. Brake Best Select and Import Direct brake pads are engineered for all driving conditions to restore and improve braking performance. With application specific friction formulas, noise canceling shims, and low dust operation. Trust Brake Best and Import Direct to deliver better braking. Don't take a chance on your next brake repair. The professional parts people at O'Reilly Auto Parts will help you find the brake parts and supplies you need to do the job right the first time. 
Stop by your local O'Reilly Auto Parts today or visit online, O'ReillyAuto.com. As we celebrate 14 years of podcasting, here's another memorable moment from the Adam Carolla Show's Ace Award Adam Carolla Show. Jim Belushi is with us. Growing up, Belushi, season three. New- Growing Belushi. Oh, I'm sorry, growing up. Ugh. I took my glasses off for 10 <laughs> seconds and fucked it up. There it is. Growing Belushi, season three. Uh, new episodes, Wednesdays on Discovery Channel and streaming on Discovery Plus as well. Yes. Um, so you got to, I mean, crazy. Brother, team, shows up at uh, SNL, John first, then Jim. You show up in 83, is that correct, Jim? Yeah, yeah. And who was in that class, that rookie class, as you came in? And uh, the rookie one was Joe Biscoe, Eddie Murphy, Brad Hall, Julie Louise Dreyfus, Mary Gross, Tim Kazarinski, Gary Kroger. And that, yeah. that was in your rookie class. Right. And then the second year was... Uh, the, you know, he went and got the All Stars. He went and got Billy Crystal, Christopher Guest, uh, he, Harry Shear, Marty Short, um, me. I stayed. Who else stayed? Julie stayed. Did it seem? I mean. Everybody I speak to about their SNL experience seems to say, like, first they were elated to be a part of it, and then it immediately sort of turned into a comp- competition and 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 a lot of um, politicking, and it just it, it turned into something fast where you had to be a real advocate for yourself and get writers to write stuff that you were in, and, like, it... It became this sort of blessing and a curse for a lot of people. Their experience, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, it, it was, it was hardball. It was the real world. It was the mass unit of comedy. It was uh, you, you get thrown into, uh, you know, it wasn't a snake pit by any means. The people are lovely, but it was a, uh, it was the real thing. It was competitive. You could be a star overnight if you came up with the right phrase, right. You know, and so everybody was trying to write the right phrase. And, you know, they told me one time it was the most important thing to be in the first half hour of Saturday Night Live because Saturday Night Live doesn't fight competition. Saturday Night Live fights sleep. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if, if it's not at 1030, say, in the Midwest, by 11 o'clock, when the news, you know, the update starts, right after the update, they lose audiences. So they take a lot of the commercials out of that first half hour and move it to that back hour. And they used to, that was almost like trash time, you know, just like throw these scenes in the back. So the competition was to get in that first half hour because that was the higher viewership. And that was where the energy was keeping the laps going. So... To get a scene in that first half hour, you most likely had to have a scene with the host. So, you know, you had to write scenes for the host, for you and the host, or get writers to write scenes where you're included with the host. So, yeah, it was it was it, it was a brutal math to work out against your creativeness and vulnerability and all that kind of emotional thing that drives you. So, it was a very um, it was like sink or swim, you know. I mean, you really. And by the way, I I sunk a couple of times, and they pulled me out. You know, Dick Ebersol pulled me out of the water a couple of times. I, you know, I don't know what I don't care what people say about Dick Ebersol, but he was monumental in teaching me how to survive. Did he pass recently? No, no, no. He's around. He's oh, he's around. around. Oh yeah, I saw him not too long ago. Oh, I'm trying to think who I thought. Yeah, you wrote a book about it, too, uh, just recently. Did he uh, but survive? It was, a, it, was, it was competition. It was competition. Did he survive a plane crash or did his son? Yes, yes. he lost his son. Yeah, he lost his crash, son. right? Yeah, yeah, he lost his son. I had some vague recollection of that. 
Yeah, yeah I mean, the idea <laughs> that SNL is still on and still relevant in 2023 is kind of, kind of insane. I mean, people... You know, people go, well, the young and the restless has been on for 51 years. I know yeah. it's just, it's just one group that it does essentially the same thing day in and day out. This is different. This is a much harder, the, the attrition there's, all right, there's the young and the restless been 50 years and days of our lives have been 50 years, yeah. but mad TV's not been on for 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> or according to Jim. <laughs> uh, yes. There's a, there's a much short, you know, you have the lifespan of a hamster, not a sea turtle when you do yeah. comedy and the idea that they've kept this thing evolving and surviving and thriving for <clears throat> since your brother was there in the Well, you know, 70s. it almost died. You know, it almost died when Lauren Michaels left and Gene Dominion took it over. Right. Uh, that show almost fell off the earth, and Dick Ebersol came in and revived it. He saved the show, and then, then he was ready to go, and he gave it to, back to Lauren, and Lauren took it, and Lauren is really the one keeping it alive all these years. He really gets it, you know. And the, the thing that's interesting about SNL is there are many popular people who made their name on SNL, you know, your Eddie Murphy's and, and those Dana Carvey's and stuff. And then there are people who are on it, like Julie Louis Dreyfus and, and uh, Robert Downey Jr. and stuff, people like that, that didn't make their bones on SNL, but made their bones in other, other places at other times. It's kind of yeah. interesting. Yeah. Well, I'm, again, the, the training, those two years on Saturday Night Live were the toughest years of my career. And and I survived it and learned so much from it that it really helped me more in my, you know, pursuing ventures after. You know? can, can you give us an example of like what Dick did to help pull you out? And like, where were you mentally and what was going on and why you needed to be pulled out? Oh, I was crazy, man. I was just crazy. <laughs> I was crazy. It's so emotional. Then I, I mean, you lost your brother, it. right? Like, right. Well, that, I had that underneath. That? It. Oh. But the audience was very nice about it. They, they, you know, it was like a football player in high school. Like a brother was a star. And then they can't wait for the other brother. And then support. They were very nice to me. It was my own mental thing, you know. But it wasn't even that. It was just, it was crazy pressure. And I just was a little crazy. I mean, I literally threw a fire extinguisher at Dick Ebersol once. I was like, ah! You know? And uh, so he fired me. He fired me right at Christmas. And, you know, it woke me up. Hmm. And in January, I went back and I got humble and put in my place, which needed to be done and he put me on probation and guided me and that was the best I you know I break it down in semesters because John once said you know he left after four years I went John what are you doing <laughs> what are you leaving for he goes ah Jimmy it's like high school you get the senior year and you gotta go <laughs> mm. so I was in my sophomore year and my second semester sophomore year was my best work, my best sensibility. I got everything. And it was because Dick gave me a chance, a second chance. And I pulled myself together and I got it together. And and he he was just instrumental in teaching me. And then then Lauren took over and he cleaned slate, you know. Yeah. That's cool that you can appreciate that because I know a lot of people who, if they're you know they're treated like that, they would take it personally. They feel like they're being put down, but you you actually use it to be productive. Well, you know, you're either uh, you either find enlightenment or you get dragged to it. <laughs> hmm. And uh, Dick dragged me to it, and he goes, "Now look, this is the way it works." Well, I I will also say maybe I'm glad he took the energy. Yes. Well, that's I'm a good glad point. He cared. Yeah. I mean, he cared enough. He could have just easily got rid of me and said, eh, fuck you, Belushi. You know? Well, I, I will say this, that if you grow up 
playing sports and especially football, then a guy's older than you yelling at you is, is not received how normally people receive it now. Oh, so, no, 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 no. You exactly. can't do that. <laughs> so I understood that older dudes yelling at me was because they wanted me to thrive or do something different that would benefit me or the team or whatever. And I, I got completely conditioned to old dudes yelling at me. So yeah, if yeah. you do that to a 19 year old now, they yell, you're not the boss of me, or they quit, or they oh, feel right back. They <laughs> yell at you, or they say it's an unsafe working condition or whatever it is. But maybe oh, yeah. with Jim's days of playing high school football, a guy giving you a yank on the chain and the tough love, you know, because you'd get benched or you'd get. Yeah, you, know, you bench, go walk, get out of your uniform. Run back, some laps, back. you know, yeah. whatever, whatever that was. You you equated that with A, I need to do better and B, I've disappointed this person and C, good, I'll learn something. And the person's taken when they stop talking to you, that's when you got to worry. <laughs> yeah. And everyone wants to be left alone now, but. They shouldn't. They should have these yeah, coaches. It's hard. Yeah. It's so hard. maybe a little bit of your hard scrabble upbringing mixed with some organized sports made you more receptive to it than the average twenty-four year old or whatever. Oh you yeah, no, I don't think anybody would take that now. No. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I, I, he didn't yell at me. By the way, he was, he was cold, was businesslike. He goes, "That's it, you know, go." And I was floating like, you know, and, you know, there's a phrase, you know, you go in the basement or the rabbit hole, but the basement and you can't get out of the basement right away. You can't walk out of that basement until you learn why you're in the basement. So he let me hang for a while down there in the basement until I, I started going, you know, I'm being a big baby. I want to get my own way. And, you know, it's, not the way it works. I was trained in ensemble. Get back to the ensemble mentality. What are you doing? But that competition made it so so threatening that to compete. You know, I'm used to ensemble where I make you look good and you make me look good and the scene looks good. Our idea is to make the scene look good. And then Saturday Night Live, it was about if I get a phrase that catches on, I'm a star. So all of a sudden the ensemble thing goes away and you're like leading forward, right? So I had to get back to ensemble, back to that spirit I learned at Second City, which John and Danny and all those guys had. You know, so was, it was uh, good. what who was the cast on your last season while you were there? Uh Harry Shear, Marty Short, Christopher Guest. Billy Crystal, Julie Louise Dreyfus, me. I th I think it was Brad Hall, Gary Kroger, Rich, Rich Hall, Rich, Rich Hall. Hall. That's right. That's right. So after you, you know, nice you're out of SNL. What are you? Thirty years old at this point? Yeah. Um, Probably 30, yeah. And maybe. are you feeling un? Are you, are you, are you feeling maybe 28? Maybe 28. I mean, you're young. Do you want to be out of SNL at this point? No, I want to learn it. So you wanted to I wanted, stay. I wanted to stay because to me, to me, SNL takes a few years to get. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see guys on SNL have been on there for eight years, 10 years now. I mean, but it took three or four years for them to really find their place on that show. And I felt that second semester, I was just starting to get it. And that third year, I would have been really on my feet. Um, so, no, I wanted, I wanted to do – I wanted to get the senior year. Right. <laughs> and well, it was like I went to a junior college instead. So, you know, you still learn in junior college. Where'd you where'd you go after SNL? What was the next project? I did Salvador with Oliver Stone and Jimmy oh, Wood. Oh yeah. And I did About Last Night with Rob Lowe and Demi Moore. Oh, that's right. All right. So I did all right. No, no. <laughs> so people forget it's not on my list. But well, I mean, Oliver Stone he, he put me in his movie Salvador, which was the deepest, darkest. 
Salvador. I mean, yeah. Uh, it was it was one of the hardest movies. I mean, some people say it was better than Platoon. Platoon was his next movie. Oh, listen, Salvador is a great movie. Yeah. Great. But I said, Oliver, how did you cast me in this? I mean, I didn't have the audition. He cast me. And he goes, I like that white rap you did on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> he said, how did you me and that rap and this character stuck in the middle of Salvador? I don't know, but I'm going with it. Yeah, the so James Woods nominated. Yeah, oh, it was and, a great and, and, and Oliver. Oliver was nominated. It was a great film, and Jim was great in it. And Jim played a San Francisco radio DJ or something who wanted to get his dog out of the pound. Yeah, and he was. It was just. It was an unexpected turn because it was comedic, but it was very serious. At the same time, like your character was like in a lot of anguish over this dog, and and it, the movie was just heavy as shit, but good. And people, you know, I here's what I would liken it to: I saw John Voight about a week ago, and I just walked up to him and I said, uh, "Runaway Train." That's a great uh, movie. Ah, Kachalowski, yes. A, th- train. He was great in that. People don't know that movie. And Runaway Train and Salvador are kind of the same film. Very good. Two big actors. You don't know, you, you, you don't remember them from that. It's not in their top 10 of the IMDb or whatever. Two great films that uh, uh, most people haven't seen. So I'll, I'll put Salvador and Runaway Train in that same. Oh, uh, go, go, yeah. Get them, get them tonight, kids, and check them out. Yeah, and then that was about last night was a really funny rom com. And 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 it holds up today, by the way. I mean, it holds up today. Same thing about relationships. Same thing about fear of commitment with men. It, it, it holds up today. Yes, Jim's character was Bernie Litko. Very funny comedic relief. Uh, Demi Moore and Rob Lowe and Rob Lowe had a restaurant in Chicago and we had, he did restaurant supply in Chicago. Yeah, he wanted, the restaurant supply business. That's what we were working. But at. he wanted to open his own restaurant in Chicago. So it had some themes, some Belushi themes in there. And it was a very Chicago centric rom-com, but it wasn't one of those nineties rom-coms that got kind of schmaltzy no, 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 later. No, no. It was uh-huh. more interesting. Adam, it was based on a David Mamet play, Sexual oh, Perversity That's Chicago. why. That's why it so, had. I mean, you know, it, it was, you know, the play was 60 minutes long, and I, I was in the play in Chicago. It was a big hit in Chicago. And uh, Don Simpson came to see me, and he said, you know, you should do a movie of that play. So Jason Brett and Stuart Oak and the producers, they said, what do you say? What did Don Simpson say? And I told them that. So they went out and got Tim Kazarinski and Denise DeClue, and they they uh, got a spec script. And that's what they eventually sold. And it was so it was based on the play. So the movie is an hour and 50 minutes, and the play is 60 minutes. So you can imagine how much adaptation was done. <laughs> but most of the scenes that I did, I'd say 60% of them, were directly lifted from the play, like that opening sequence. I mean, that's David Mamet. Well, that, so that was interesting. So as you're watching this rom-com with Demi Moore and Rob Lowe, but you're getting some strong dialogue in there, and it and it it felt it felt like there's a lot more there than what you would think a rom-com. You know, J Lo is playing the maid, and she falls in love with Hugh Grant or whatever. It wasn't <laughs> yeah, that. It was like it was formula. real. Yeah. But I was too young. I didn't know I was watching Mammoth. Yeah, I was yeah, just okay. like, it, but again, it's like it's a rom-com that doesn't feel like a rom-com. Uh, very real, very authentic, very grounded. And and I've always felt that Denise DeClue and Tim Kazarisky should have been nominated for an adaptation. Because they really took the heart of that play and made it into something new, but still kept the same values that Mammoth put into play. So now you got about last night, you got Salvador, and if time permits, and now, runaway train. And now growing Belushi. Growing Belushi. Growing <laughs> Belushi. Season three. New episodes uh, on Discovery Channel and streaming on uh, Discovery as well. So, um, 
Jim, do you, how much writing do you do or do you write? Well, in growing Belushi, it's totally improvised. Yes. But we've, we improvise it all. We reframe some scenes. We set up some outlines based on real events. So it's, that's all written by all of us. Um, you know, so I do a lot of writing there. I wrote on Saturday Night Live. I just wrote a script with my daughter. So I write. You know, I'm a member of the Writers Guild East because mm-hmm. of Saturday Night Live. So I do a little writing, but I wouldn't consider myself a writer. Are you in L.A. at all anymore? I'm in L.A. right now. Oh, shit. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. thought you are back back on the farm. Oh, I am. I mean, but I, I don't stay anywhere for more than four days, Adam. I, I go to the farm. I stay there longer because it's, you know, the harvest and there's times that you really, I really want to be there. I go to Chicago. I go to Martha's Vineyard. I come here. I go visit Danny in Canada. I mean, I'm, I, I got a lot of frequent flyer miles. And a good life. And, uh, and nice to see, I mean, you've been this way for a while, but uh, settled in, philosophical, comfortable in your own skin. Mm-hmm. And enjoy. Just it. recently, though, I yes. honestly, You're God, enjoying I mean, the last twenty minutes of the ride. I, I, you know, the last twenty minutes, right before I talked to you, I started feeling that peace of myself, and now I feel really good. <laughs> Jim Belushi, Grown Belushi, uh, Discovery. Always good to talk to you, my friend. Always, Adam, and I, and I really want to. I really want to be in the studio with you sometime, and let's let's have a, let's have a day of it. You're fun, man. I love being with you. Uh, right back at you. Thank you so much for joining us, Jim Belushi. You can go to uh, adamcroll.com for all the live shows. Right, we're coming up in Vegas, Vegas OKC, okay, New, New York, yeah, Sony Hall. It's all going to be there. So. Until next time, Sam Crow for Chris Maxpana and Jim Belushi saying, Mahalo. Mahalo.